Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for allowing us to come into your awesome city and have a get together. It's fantastic. Uh, I'm Ashley Stoltzman. I am one of the county commissioners, and we're going to go around and all say our name and who we are, um, just in case people don't know each other, haven't had a chance to connect or meet, and um, that way we all know who's in the room. But it is really wonderful to get together and to get to see everybody and enjoy a meal together and spend some time talking. Mm -hmm. And so, and then at this point, if you want to introduce yourself, yeah, great. Clearly, I'm one of the county commissioners. I've been all everybody. Susie Valdeferrin, uh, City Council. And Jody Marsh, Assistant City Manager. I'm Harold Dominguez, City Manager. Sandy Cedar, the other Assistant City Manager. <laughs> Joan Pet, and I want to welcome you to our city and to our incredible redesigned room. Yes. Which, I don't think we would have hosted you in here two months well. ago. So, <laughs> welcome to the door. Chiquita Yabra, Longmont City Council. Martha Lutchman, County Commissioner, and I love Longmont. Everyone knows that. I'm a super fan, and I live here, and I've had the pleasure of working here for the city of Longmont in the past, so I feel like I'm at home. It's like everybody knows Dan. <laughs> Sean McCoy, City Council. I'm Janet Pearson, and the Boulder County Administrator. Diane Christ, Longmont City Council. Awesome. Eugene May, City Attorney. Barb Heldon, Commissioner's Office, Special Projects. Uh, Ryan Gazi, I own Angle Sports on Main Street. I'm Scott Cook, I'm the CEO of the Walmart Chamber. Hi, I'm Molly Fitzgerald, I'm Public Media. All right, thank you everybody. So our first topic on the agenda is update on regional goals and other topics. Um, so this is really an open section. Uh, Natalie, our commissioner's deputy, is sick and not here, uh, but she was hoping that each of us could talk about maybe one topic that's a regional goal that's on their mind. Um, and so I'm happy to kick off sort of the format that it might work in, and if we don't like this, we can pivot and do it differently. But one regional uh, topic that we're working on is around wildfire preparedness and mitigation. And so, uh, as you all know, the whole community passed a wildfire mitigation tax that the county is administering, and we're really trying to get every resident in the county aware of the risk of wildfire and fire. And every person can make a difference that will affect the outcome that they'll have if fire comes to their neighborhood. And so, for me, um, I don't know if everybody knows, but I was the mayor of Louisville during the Marshall Fire, so I have a lot of stress and PTSD and worry in some ways about other areas that seem vulnerable. So when I see the western edge of Longmont, like I can see what happened in Louisville happening in Longmont. I never wanted to. Uh, I don't want anyone's community to ever be affected by fire, but we know there's fire risk. And so making sure everybody, every single resident in Boulder County knows that there's fire risk, even at their house, even if they live in a city, that there could be a fire risk and that they have a plan and that they can do things to mitigate against the, the worst effects. So right now, every single resident, every Longmont resident, every Boulder County resident qualifies for a $500 grant to work on mitigation on their house. So we have a program about chunks of junipers and about uh, fences or fuses and things like that to help people get a little bit of money to offset some of the costs that they'll experience um, when they do the work. Like if you hire someone to remove junipers, it can get pricey. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is this incentive is supposed to get you thinking about it, get you going, so you can think about wildfire preparedness a little bit differently. So that's one regional goal that we're all working on together that I just wanted to raise awareness to. So if there are others that y'all would like to share, it's your turn. I'm happy to jump in, maybe in Anyone in the meeting. Um, but so as I look around the table, I guess there are two things that come to mind that I work a lot on. Um, one is the Regional Opioid Advisory Council, where I, I see Carol um, once a month. And the other, of course, is Dr. Cobb, which uh, Mayor Peck and I um, sit on together. Uh, and I, I, think I'll, uh, I think I'll talk about the um, the, the regional work we do through Dr. Cog, and most excitingly, um, the work that's going to be starting this fall, still, I would think in October, on the 119 improvements. And long time coming. Um, we've been working long before I became a county commissioner to assemble the money to 
to um, do improvements along 119 that would include uh, a 12-foot wide concrete multi-use path down the median. Uh, it would be grade separated so that you would not have at grade crossings at some of the busy cross streets like the 63rd and Niwot Road. Um, and and on the on the lanes themselves, the, the, the corridor would not be. I commuted to the state legislature during the Highway 36 um, rebuild that, that that was part of the fast tracks ballot measure. It, it will not be that. I mean, that was a nightmare. Uh, what what uh, will happen in order to facilitate um, bus rapid transit? It will be at the intersections. There will be what uh, CDOT calls Q jump lanes. So. Buses uh, that may be stuck in the back of the long line of cars would be able to go around those cars um, to the front of the line at the traffic signal, and then there'll be a special traffic signal that controls them. They'll get to go out in front of uh, the rest of the traffic at every intersection. So that will, uh, that will reduce the bus times. And um, so the last piece of funding for that, $25 million raise grant, they're back at night in our trips to D.C. every March um, to meet with our congressional delegation, um, secured letters of support for the $25 million raise grant. We got that a year ago. We're still celebrating that because that was the last money we needed to do the trip. Uh, and so it'll just be a wonderful um, uh, you know, opportunity to lessen the commute times between Boulder and Longmont. And we know that the commuting is bi-directional. It's not all one way. Um, it'll really make um, bicycle commuting a possibility there. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, down the line, looking at how to extend that out to I-25, um, which is outside of RTD, and uh, facilitate uh, more regional transit up into Polk uh, County and into the Fort Collins. So, oh, go ahead. Go around. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I don't know. So the idea is that we yeah. can go around and go, oh, but it's, it's supposed fine. to be an enjoyable meeting. And so yes. if it comes to you, and that <laughs> seems awful, it's not <laughs> 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 so you can pass. I just, no one has to go, but I know that every single person is here because they represent their community. And mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot, they could be very different topics. It doesn't necessarily have to be regional. It could be specific. Okay. Like, it could be whatever comes to your heart in this moment. And if you don't feel like playing, we can move on. <laughs> okay. I know I wasn't prepared to Sorry. discuss regional goals, but okay. That's why it says we have other topics. And uh, another topic. Oh, oh sorry. we're on the bottom. No, so there, okay. there's two versions of the agenda. Okay. Very, oh, very, very, uh, very oh, okay. uh, But I'm looking at the wrong one. And, <laughs> okay. Sorry. And so it's update That's on regional goals and other topics. Okay. So just well, like I feel here. like what we do as a council, it's kind of a joint, you know, it's not one individual but something i i do sit on the um, steering committee for the core needs team so mental health is a passion of mine and looking at um just legislation to help support mental health we've had discussions around that as well this is something that's very personal to me but just looking so i'm able to meet with the um emily ben, ben um, from the last name and the work that the car core and leads team is doing. So I mean, it really, the, what they've been able to accomplish in that department is, is phenomenal. Because, and you know, coming from, you know, I have a son with autism and mental health issues, diagnosed now schizophrenia, and having had instances where we had to call the police, where it was pre-core and lead team and where we're at now, when they've come out, how they have a social worker, a mental health facilitator, the police. So being able to work with someone and say, you know, so when we're calling 911, we're saying, hey, he's, um, you know, he has autism, and mental illness. So they're, they're able to bring someone in who knows how to facilitate. So being able to talk him down. It's, so hearing, not just seeing it firsthand, but also seeing you know through these meetings how they're able to um, you know what getting in touch with all you know different departments and how they're all working together i think one of the biggest challenges that had been in the past was the the crossover so like maybe they might be 
connecting through Boulder County. An individual might be connecting with Boulder County, but not communicating with Longmont Police. They get in trouble with Longmont Police, or something happens, and then there's no crossover of information. So recently, I think it was seven hundred thousand um, grant. I don't know. It, you know I'm going to the source of all knowledge over mm -hmm. there um, uh, for a um, <coughs> da database. So it'll actually so as police contact or work with an individual, they're able to get, or our impacts team individuals work with a resident, they're able to put that information into this database and it, it crosses over. So, and then it allows us to, to get numbers of you know, unhoused, of people, you know, making frequent calls to, um, for drug addiction, for mental illness. And so, so hopefully that'll help give us a, you know, a better grasp on what's happening in our community and how we can best support the needs. So that's something that's really, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in. <laughs> so, awesome. And they've been doing good work. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Mayor oh, Peck, we, we're going to jump to Mayor, Mayor Peck. I'm trying to keep us on roughly a time schedule to have us done by 7.30, so if I get a little bossy, that's why. Mm -hmm. I know you actually. <laughs> <laughs> So what, what I'm excited about, and uh, I'm finally not going to talk about housing or transportation, but our uh, county composting facility that we, uh, council gave uh, direction to work with the Boulder County staff on getting a regional composting facility, uh, as well as um, um, recycling and just trash in the future, but at the moment we're working on the uh, composting facility, and it is Charlie Caminitas from our, from our city, uh, David Bell and his staff, um, and we do have sustain some sustainable environmental people on the board, mm -hmm. as well as the staff from Boulder County. So they're making headway, and hopefully by, by the end of the year, we'll have something solid in place. Um, at the moment, the talk is that it will be located in Longmont. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, the land is in the city of Longmont, but in Boulder County. So we also need to work with Boulder County. Oh, Weld County? Yeah. Oh, Weld County. We all know what you mean. They're all mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Now you know how my council meetings go. <laughs> no. Oh, they left to be breezy on that one. Uh, <laughs> So I'm very excited about that, and those are ongoing meetings. Uh, we don't really have any data at the moment to share, but thank you. Yeah, um, <clears throat> when I think originally, and I know you said it doesn't have to be, but I do think about the affordable housing mm -hmm. and the unhoused uh, mm -hmm. population as well. Um, you know, us. how are we going to prevent younger people from being unhoused, um, you know, transients and uh, that's coming from other states and that are teenagers that left home for whatever reason and they came to the state of Colorado and uh, wonderful city of Longmont or Boulder County in general. So um, hoping and believing that we can create a system to where we can prevent that and together, of course, is a great resource uh, for young people, but um, how, at least within our city and probably Lafayette and moving around, how can we uh, prevent um, these young people moving from city to city to city? And how can we make sure that we provide the support that they need? Because together is only, um, you know, is only one organization. And so, um, yeah, that, of, of, of course, with affordable housing, but the goal is to prevent young people from, more young people from being unhoused and making sure that they are prepared to be successful, whether it's going into the workforce or whether if it's for them to go to school, to get a degree, whatever it may be, making sure that we have the necessary resources for them and be there and be available for them. So, thank you very much. Um, it's all big topics. It's mm -hmm. great. Um, when I think about regional work, there's a few pieces that I've had really the honor to work with amazing county staff um, over the last few years in regards to our COVID. Y'all were very involved in that work um, as well. Our, 
American Rescue Plan Act funding, which we are still working on, um, and have one more big project, I think, about gun violence prevention and some of the work that we did regionally around different ordinances to protect residents throughout the county. Um, I think about the emergency services ballot measure and the voters' support of how do we take care of volunteers who are sitting and helping and um, getting in on getting in and up all of the different areas around Boulder County and those lands and that funding that continues to respond to requests. Um, I think about the affordable and attainable housing tax um, that voters approved in 23 um, and that work that we're still working with folks and, and have some additional meetings. Um, but I think I'll touch on the, the most recent one that is a convening that yeah. um, Council Member Farring is working on um, as your rep in the regional uh, homelessness summit that we had um, in January and then some of the follow-up work. So just as an update for the rest of the council, mm -hmm. Um, we've got three meetings scheduled. We just had our first one August 14th. Um, so we've got three monthly meetings and with electeds who are regionally looking at this topic of unhoused community members in different ways, mm -hmm. different experiences. It looks very different. And, yet, and so for yeah. me, that initial conversation was really helpful for people to, to hear what is happening regionally, which is what we really wanted. And to me, that's one of the really exciting pieces of regional work. Um, because we're all in different places and hearing different pieces. And so I'm very hopeful about the group that has, um, I think, volunteered themselves from each yeah. council or the board of trustees. Yeah. I don't know how that process works. Um, but like I said, we are officially started in that this summer. And, and then that group will make a decision about how we want to use the federal all-in-one plan to uh, make some commitments for, for, for our region. So that's some of the, what's happening. Thank you. Well, regionally, uh, I'm the Consortium of Cities representative from Longmont, and so I'm also working with the uh, working group in regards to the uh, uh, fire mitigation. And I'm like Leslie, I'm the teacher at Louisville, we're in Monarch, where the fire burned right up to the doorstep. We had students that lost their homes and their parents and families um, and friends that lost homes and colleagues. And so that, that's near and dear to my heart because I think that's uh, important. And we saw how Longmont just literally dodged the bullet uh, uh, just almost uh, nine months earlier. Uh, and if it hadn't been for an episode of, of uh, uh, during the Calvary fire, if it hadn't been for an episode where we had gotten some weather uh, that uh, uh, got some moisture into the uh, area, we, we literally were finding in the uh, the western northwestern side of town, you know, uh, half dollar size pieces of people's library that had gotten kicked up into the atmosphere so high it was coming out of the Calwood uh, uh, fire neighborhood and landing uh, just right there at the airport and uh, uh, Mountain View. And so, you know, those are the sort of things that you know we could have could have had experienced this even earlier. Uh, and so. Uh, I don't want any neighborhood to be in that situation. And I, and I see that you know, we've got uh, some exposed parts always, everywhere. And, uh, we, and we've had a really, really hot month of August and that, so, and dry. So I'm always a little bit concerned that somebody will either, you know, not be thinking and do something dumb, and then we'll be in the thick of it. So that's something I'm really, Passionate about because I, you know, I saw the ramifications of it firsthand. People that literally had run out the door, and some didn't even have the dogs and cats. You know. That was hard. Thank you. Well, during this budget season, um, and also in the private sector, we're um, doing budgeting and looking at um, the effects of. COVID that still are persisting in terms of recovery for um, small business and work in the small business industry. That's less than 50 employees, not necessarily small dollar amounts. And um, just uh, considering how are we going to move forward to activate our economy again, especially with local businesses. And I think that we have a real opportunity to negate the residual effects of inflation and also 
you know, build a, a good economy again with um, the effort to produce. I think some of our supply chain <coughs> producers everywhere. And if we can do it here, and I believe it's best done at the local and regional level, at the state level, and it will work its way up. So, so anyway, I'm, um, I'm an accountant by profession, so and that's something that we're working on. And it seems like every day I'm rolling up my sleeves and getting on the computer and looking at <laughs> some of the same data as I was saying to the mayor last night. Um, to see what we can do to improve things. Awesome. Thank you. That, that was really inspiring to hear what's on everyone's mind. Are there any other topics we need to cover in this section, or should we use that segue to jump right into local minimum wage conversation? I just wanted to share something with Susie, mm -hmm. which I can share with her later. But, it, but well, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, well, it's an initiative that the um, City of Board Police Department has on, around um, people with autism and, and yeah. other um, forms of development and disabilities, where they've they've worked with uh, the Center for People with yeah, Disabilities yes. on a sticker uh -huh. that you can have on your car window, you could have it like on your door, so mm -hmm. a responding law enforcement officer or anybody who's responding would know that there is someone in that car or in that home who may have autism mm -hmm. and they may be aware of the gender um, so they're just rolling this out, it's totally voluntary. Yeah. 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 I know about that. It's a great yeah. 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 Just for the good of the group, yes. um, what yes. Councilmember McCoy was alluding to was our subcommittee on, we're supporting regionally the September is, so we're in it right now, yeah. September is National Preparedness Month. Yes. And so if, if those events haven't got shared from our Office of Disaster Management, we can get those sent over to whoever would like them. So, because everyone's invited. And Tom's up. We can start shouting out that work that we're doing. We can start shouting. I don't see any other gestures that make me think anyone wants to jump in. So we'll move to the next topic, which is local minimum wage. I'll turn it to Commissioner Levy. She's been the team lead for us on this one. Sure. Um, and we, so I did distribute just a, a two pager that our staff put together on um, you know, where our minimum wage falls relative to Denver, Colorado, and Edgewater. Mm -hmm. So Denver and Edgewater do not very well. Uh, the, the two other local governments that have um, adopted a local minimum wage, and then um, you know, what what our process was, and I know that um, your council, uh, I guess a week ago, um, had your own your study session on it, and so I, I thought you know, what it would just be interesting to have a discussion if you all comfortable on that with, you know, I know there was an, an action item out of your council meeting, but um, you know, just a, a discussion about where you think one month might go, um, what opportunities, this was a big topic at, mm -hmm. at the Boulder City Council meeting about well, how how do we um, then come back and make this a regional and truly regional process with mm -hmm. reasoning that, um, that if we all can get on the same page about a minimum wage, then cities aren't playing off against one another for new development opportunities, all the people who are coming who are challenged by mm -hmm. the cost of housing and just the cost of living in general um, can can benefit from it. And so um, I guess I would open the floor to go to thoughts about um, okay. first where, off, Commissioner mm -hmm. Levy, you have to tell us if you listen to the whole meeting. <laughs> I did not know that okay. because that, so, yeah. that was a test, basically. We, yeah. <laughs> I was not. I was actually coming back from a long weekend. And we so, oh, yeah. so I watched, yeah. and so. I didn't. I did not stay on until two thirty or whatever in the morning. Yeah. I did watch yes. all of the council discussion <clears throat> and staff presentation, and I did not stay for the, your whole mm -hmm. epic meeting that went into the early early hours. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think, but you had several topics too, not just that one. We did it. Yeah. You guys should be applauded for your commitment to the community because I just think people don't realize what an effort and tremendous commitment it is to be a council member and how much time, effort, and energy you put in really trying to represent your constituents. And they elected you to have the interest in the community effort. So just huge thank yous. And no, I didn't stay the whole time, but I did hear all of each of your comments and I heard the staff presentation. 
You did. Well, if we go to 2 a.m. again, we're going to have dancing, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how many times have you come home at 2 a.m. and they not had dancing? Dance. Yeah, I, know. Okay. I was drinking a glass of wine while they listened. Okay. <laughs> well, that's helpful. You needed it. So. <laughs> Well, I guess I'll kick it off. If you know, um, we have that presentation by uh, from a survey that we did with the others, with the other municipalities. Uh, a lot of information. Uh, it brought up a lot of questions as well. Um, and I don't have at this point a way that I feel that I want to go. I know that I've discussed with other entities, uh, with Scott, it, Scott's group, and other businesses, etc. that I don't think anyone is totally against a minimum wage. What most of the people that I had talked to are not in favor of the ratcheting up of that. Um, and my one concern is that there is no off-ramp for this minimum wage. Uh, for example, if most of the municipalities, or if, even if uh, Longmont said, okay, we will raise it to uh, the $15, but I can't guarantee that we would be in a place to continually raise it. Um, we would need to see what it does to our businesses. We'd have to see what it does to our population. Remember that we are on the border of Weld County. So it wouldn't be, there is a con very concerned, and I, I think that uh, Erie has the same concern that our businesses would move five miles and still get the uh, patronage that they they have in order to not have to be in this minimum wage dynamic. I am totally against the $25 an hour for everyone as a, as a total. Um, I don't, for me, I can't see paying teenagers $25 an hour. Uh, and I don't think businesses can afford that. Uh, and for us to mandate it would be a big mistake. So um, I would like to hear what the rest of you say. Well, so something I had been envisioning, and actually as I read through the packet, I was a little disappointed with the number. I was hoping that there would have been a more Comprehensive uh, sampling. Sampling of, yeah, just like a larger group of, of individuals that were um, included in the, in the analysis. Um, and so one of the things that, that I kind of envisioned early on, you know, when, um, well, uh, when the state passed this legislation, was that really it would be determined or come to an agreement on how, how much, what it would be, and how it would incrementally increase based on direction of what we're hearing from the stakeholders, which would be the business owners and employees as well, but um, because they're having to offset. The other thing, you know, is, and, you know, I'm less worried about your Walmarts and your Costco's and your bigger entities where they can absorb that. I'm really concerned about the small businesses, and those are the pieces that make long money unique. So I guess that's where I was, like, how do we, what are some kind of tax credits or something that we can offer, you know, what is deemed a small business to offset that cost? So what, what are some ways that we can, we can work together to, to make this feasible? As well as addressing other issues with housing and, and all the things. But, uh, but in, re in re regard to this, I, I really would have, I, I like to and continue, I continue to have the desire to meet with, um, Businesses. I think we're, um, Councilmember Yarbrough um, brought up the idea of having a, a stakeholder meeting, um, a fishbowl. <laughs> we went around with that, but just so we could really hear business cards from our from our um, constituents who are business owners and how we can kind of come to a resolution together. And based on what you're seeing too, it was the fact that there seemed to be just such a small residual. Uh, benefit like uh, one percentage when we looked at the at the data that was presented it was like so minuscule but the biggest concern was is that those most vulnerable businesses maybe some nonprofits and others like that oh, yeah. would would be eliminated we know that the Walmarts and the targets and the others are they will meet our 
meet it every time. The Home Depots, they'll meet that. Why? Because they want to corner this market. And the small businesses and those uh, nonprofits will be the ones that are the, uh, the casualties that many of us are concerned about. You know, I'm a, I'm a career technical teacher by, by trade and everything. And so my feeling was is that I'd like to see, to what the mayor was pointing out, I'd like to see more of a certification sort of aspect to this where we say that if we're gonna move forward with this, there's that's that's the qualifier that uh, you know if you have to be certified to do the job, but it's still kind of an entry level job. Let's say like a lifeguard, uh, that type of job. You still have to have first aid, CPR, and uh, and lifeguard training. Those certifications show people that there's a benefit to getting more education and other things like that. I also think that there's maybe a benefit that uh, to to encouraging uh, some businesses. Uh, some areas of our business market to do more unionized, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of an encouragement, like some of the uh, places that I would think would be like uh, building contractors and so folks like that. So there's some stability in the costs of these uh, uh, of building uh, that sort of thing. Once you have your labor secured and have a, a find cost to it, uh, and then you can really start trying to cut down the, the cost of of, uh, of what it takes to build something. And uh, and then we also know that these guys are protected, that they have uh, benefits and other things like that, and that, uh, that the safety aspects of it too is important. So those are some things that I I think uh, they're, plus I, I have a lot of faith in the, the voters themselves. Uh, I don't think that uh, this is such a big uh, ask of them that I think we need to put it to them to actually uh, implement it. Okay, I just was yeah. watching for micro signals from people who are ready to talk. I didn't see her move yet. I had a micro in front of movement, but I can yeah. So I have to agree with the mayor that I think that I don't. I haven't heard anyone who said that they didn't believe in increasing the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. I think the the number one issue is how we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And what I've heard is the fear of when it becomes twenty five dollars an hour. That's the freak out moment. Mm -hmm. And that's where most businesses and most people stop. They're stagnant at that. Mm -hmm not the, the incremental before that, you know? And so it's that $25 an hour. How in the world am I going to be able to pay that $25 an hour per, per employee or, you know, whatever the organization, no one knows what, where they're going to be at at that time. Now, I'm kind of torn about the, the teenage. Um, I was, I remember when my first year in college, I was 19 years old. I mean, I wasn't, I was probably 18 and a half. And I came home for the summer from school, from college, and ended up getting a job making $19 an hour. And that was like way back in the day, in the 80s. And so a lot of students didn't go back to school because they saw the, that money and they were like, Psh. I need to go back to school for what? I'm making good money. To them back then in the 80s, $19 an hour was a lot. Um, so I think about that in the responsibility of a teenager. Granted, I was an older teenager, but still. And then I think about when we look at that survey, it mentioned that most of the people that received minimum wage were high schoolers. And probably most likely that's where it needs to be. Um, most of the, the businesses that I have talked to with our local businesses in the city of Longmont are paying way above and yeah. beyond. Yeah. Uh, $17 an hour or more. I mean, King Super starting off baggers at 17 something an hour. I just left there today and saw the posting for a bagger was seven, over $17 an hour. So, for me and what I've been listening to, and I'm on the board of the LDDA here for downtown, 
we just had a consultant come in and talk to the businesses downtown and part of her report, she didn't complete the report, but she said they are tired. They're already tired. Small businesses are trying to cling on and support this community. And then something like this, where they're not looking at the next maybe, what, what's the percentage we can go up 15% at the most? They're not looking at that. They're looking at that $25 an hour. Yeah. That's the mandate. You know what I'm saying? And so how can we ensure support for these businesses? Is there some type of resource, a supplemental a supplement that we can provide for these businesses while these while we are incrementally increasing um, you know the wages yeah. so how are they not the insurance is, is very expensive mm -hmm. uh, for those businesses who are providing insurance um, which I hear is, is crazy so I don't think there's anyone against making sure that someone have can um, are living are being provided with a livable wage because we all know Colorado is very expensive and we all know that businesses need to um, have employees because if not they'll burn out and a lot of them are because they're doing most of the working they're working um, and so then the other piece of this that I've been talking to businesses about and also my own daughter who's a server is how they the servers get more get paid more yes. than the cooks. Yes. yes. And so I mean I'm happy for my daughter to be walking out with, with a big wad of money. But what I'm saying is and what I've heard is they're making way above and beyond minimum wage and that's wonderful because back in the day servers were the ones who were <laughs> couldn't even pay the bills. Um, so now that that's increased the tips and all that they can get the tips and um, their minimum wage is different compared to $2 an hour it used to be. So how can we increase minimum wage according to a profession? So if we have those who are servers and if it's what, 80 an hour or whatever it is and then plus they get tips, how do we monitor that um, or how the business owner monitor that and say what they can and cannot do? Because I don't feel like we should be telling business owners what they should and shouldn't do. But how can we support them to make sure and support our community and, and the employees to make sure that they're getting paid well enough as well? And if the business owner cannot support that wage, how do we supplement or provide some type of resource for them? I'm going to piggyback on what you just said because you Okay, but give a short one. Yeah, very yeah, short. Sorry. No, 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 just so we can get to each person. So um, I, I talked to a couple breweries and <clears throat> what they are saying is that their servers are walking out with $40 an hour because of the tip and equity, but the people in the back room who are packaging, who are uh, slapping on um, labels and uh, shipping, the, they can't pay them enough to match the equity of what the servers are getting. Walking out of there with forty dollars a night and they're paying twenty five dollars an hour now to mirror laborers in the back room. So um, that inequity doesn't sit well. I'm done. Go ahead. <laughs> I think Commissioner Lutchman is next. Thank you. Oh sure. Yeah thanks. A couple pieces from the background I think might be helpful just as a reminder because it wasn't included in I was here at the beginning um, for the first two hours and then I was online. Um, the background, for me there was a piece missing for the full council who wasn't involved in the consortium meetings back pre our time um, in 2019 when the legislation mm -hmm. at the state level was being discussed. And it was on for I mean, in action what does Boulder County do regionally for the um, spring 2020 meeting and so it got delayed obviously mm -hmm. so the ask was in 2021 from the members at that time because i've been consortium through this time to bring this back with exactly what i just heard a couple of you say folks are getting paid more than 15 dollars an hour mm -hmm. this would be the opportune time to ensure for all Boulder county residents that 
they're not going to work for less than fifteen dollars an hour or an hour in Laura County. So just to give a little more context to the timing, this um, didn't start in twenty twenty three. This has been going on since the legislation got passed in nineteen. We brought it up by request from some of our different council folks in the end of twenty one, and I was leaving that work in twenty twenty two when everybody at the table at that time was on board regionally. And so for me, the biggest goal is regional. Um, so I appreciate everyone's conversation. To me, what is missing in this page document, which we could share with you too, is how we responded to some of the business support and that fund that we created at the same time, because we were wrestling with that a little bit as well. Um, so we could definitely share that if that's helpful for ideas. And you all might come up with something bigger and different, or, or we don't know. But um, I do think um, I've heard Councilmember McCoy and also Mayor Peck, when we were in consortium meetings previously, talk about putting the question out to the voters. Yes. And that really captured, you know, it was like, oh, wait, where have I heard this idea before? From the mayor. In the presentation, when the data in that presentation that we heard shared that the folks that were surveyed um, would, would board uh, a minimum wage in some regard. So that, for me, was like, well, there it is. The community is telling us exactly what they would do. I was also really interested in the folks that were brought out in that data as those put in the most vulnerable situations. The Hispanic Latino demographic here in Longmont specifically was pulled out in that data in the chart. And women were mm -hmm. the other ones who they yeah. said in the presentation are the most likely to get paid less than minimum wage. Yeah. So for me those were very compelling and I was I hadn't heard folks talk about those data points, but for Longmont residents specifically in that data point, I thought that was very interesting, and, and hopefully that helps encourage some of the conversation. Um, but I am interested in what you all are proposing around putting it to, uh, putting the topic to vote. But I would also encourage, the way I read the packet, um, in the same packet, or a similar packet the Boulder City Council folks had was um, the options A and B and D and C and however they were written up aren't the only options. Mm -hmm. And so I think yeah. this, is, like, this is a great conversation to hear you all. Um, to come up with a different escalation. Escalation doesn't have to be 15%. Yeah. And I've heard that same concern. Mm -hmm. And so how do we get a, get away from fear? We get hope, because we know hope is contagious. And so my belief is that if people in Boulder County just know they're not gonna have to work for less than $15 an hour, because inflation, insurance, childcare, student loans, and housing are issues that our residents also face. Mm -hmm. I understand that businesses face all of those too, but we are, we are sitting inside of a system that's greater than us, that's demanding for people to go fight for the crumbs. And like, mm -hmm. so what would it look like if regionally we helped businesses get what they need so that they could take care of yeah. people? Um, it would just simply be swapping the way that our resources and our systems are set up. So I just share that as, as a part of the conversation that, that I've been having regionally with folks and with folks that have called and asked for a little more background on the work um, from the administration. Mm -hmm. Did Holder have the presentation? Yes. Yeah. yeah, Diane. Well, what we hear from businesses is that they would like to have the flexibility to make these decisions. Uh, we heard a lot of, I felt like we had a really good turnout for the conversation in the city council chambers. Um, but our sampling size in, in the packet was not very large. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what we hear from the businesses is they would like the flexibility. Most of them report that they're paying um, market wage, but if they want to build and build their business and you know, have seasonal help, what have you, they need to bring on people at a lower wage, a training wage, you know, to, to replace and shadow the employees that they have. Um, you know, one um, uh, one business owner said, you know, there's kind of a difference between a really stellar cashier and, and uh, kind of average really needs a lot of training cashier. And so how do you make that difference? And that's really the decision of the business owner. Figure out what the contributions of that employee bring to the table. One of the things about, uh, and, and I think this is a problem of just looking at one aspect of economics is uh, we have individuals that receive assistance, and so they, they can't accept a, a raise. They can't accept $15 an hour because they would lose their assistance. Now, we all know that we've got some other work to do, and part of that is you know, building the economy, making you know, 
prosperity for everyone and then maybe we can shift some of that assistance to where people can you know step up make a higher wage and still support what their families um, without assistance from the city so but in the meantime we don't want to put people in the position of having to um, go dark you know with their employment because they, they can't accept that sort of wage because um, I think that makes them even more and um, something that came up when we talked about, you know, mostly it was teenagers are making minimum wage or senior citizens. And that's also concerning because if you're working as a senior, you probably need a little more assistance, a better wage. To me, those are two different topics. You know, we're talking about a training wage and we're talking about people that need to supplement the retirement. Or, um, for instance, you know, we have more expenses that maybe didn't plan for. Over 65 years. Um, so, uh, when I look at this chart, I think, well, a Longmont is meeting all these features right now for the reports that we're getting. And I know that uh, a lot of business people are also reporting as owners that they're working more hours than their employees, and they would like to add on more. So, so it's around to the idea of how do we build business friendly practices that allow businesses to begin to flourish. And I think that's giving them the opportunity to to apply, you know, and one size fit all doesn't work when you comparing a brewery to a um, fast food restaurant to a retailer or um, somebody that does skilled work, you know, whether somebody that's apprenticing to learn skilled labor like plumber, electrician. Um, but those are high paying jobs, but you put the effort in. So, and then um, just one other point that was brought up is education. And I, think I agree with the idea that sometimes when you're working for minimum wage, like when you're in college, and you go, I'm going to go back to college. <laughs> I'm going to study really hard today because <laughs> this isn't going to be forever when you're washing dishes in the back. <laughs> so. Thank you. I'll um, say one other thing, and that was something that uh, Councilor McCoy brought up. is. Um, he had some really great questions of the uh, economist that was talking to us and felt that uh, that economist did not have a lot of information in terms of what we're trying to do, which is come out of an inflationary period, come out of COVID. What so, well, things do we have is what the question is. Yeah. I, I know what the federal government has. I don't know what local and, and county governments have that, that influence that other than just what the mayor's talking about, uh, the ability to have a hall. Thank you. And so I'll add my comments, and then Commissioner Levy will close us out, and we'll have to all get coffee separately if there's more on this, because we have to move to the next one. But my, my comments are, um, I have sort of an invitation of a proposal. Um, so when we started working on this together in 2018, 2019, and really talking about it, I think the sentiment was, like, well, there are market areas and people should be looking at working collaboratively to look at what wages should be in a market area. And we really had wanted the state to raise minimum wage. It was, it's, it's, I probably still think this, and I thought at the time, it's really, it would be better if the state would raise the minimum wage. And the argument was, well, there are some very depressed areas in the state, there are very different areas of the state, and the market's just so different from Denver Metro to Alamosa to, uh, route County, like they're just very different markets. So y'all just work together and it'll be no problem. Oh, for sure, there's only 58 local governments in our market area. We surely can just easily work together and do it. And what I've found as we've tried to work together on this topic is a ton of fear um, along the lines of what Commissioner Lynch is saying. And uh, we had, we've made a lot of commitments to one another. Councils have come and gone since then of people saying this, this will be the year, this will be the year, and each group is, is very, what feels like, afraid of the effects because we all care about our local businesses, because we all care about the people working. What really motivated me and my vote last year um, as we worked together at the county and, and we're really trying to encourage everyone to move forward is seeing the information about who's being left behind. The market has moved. The market is not 1442. That is that is what the minimum wage in Colorado and in Longmont is this year. That is not the market wage. So 
if you work at King Supers and Target and any of these things, that is not what you're making. And there are single mothers that are making that because they're being taken advantage of and they're afraid. And that is what motivates me to make action and then figure out how to mitigate the negative consequences. So we've heard there might be negative consequences. We're afraid of what might happen. Okay, let's talk about that. What would we do? How would we run a program? How would we address that? But by, by not acting, there is a mom that is a single mom that's working multiple jobs, making 1481, and that's just completely unacceptable in Boulder County, in my opinion. That if they're contributing to society and working hard and afraid to ask for a raise, don't know how to ask for a raise, haven't been trained to ask for a raise, don't speak English and their boss speaks English, and that's not an acceptable way to pay someone contributing and working full time. Like that's just not appropriate. So I do think we have to take action because of the most vulnerable workers that don't have a voice for themselves. And then we need to address the effects for the business. That's where I come from on this. And I just want each long council member to know that everybody's watching you. Like you might not feel it, but everyone in Boulder County is looking to Longmont for leadership in this space. When I talk to members of Lafayette Council, they're like, well, we'll do it if Longmont does it. They, they could care less what Boulder's doing. Like, no, it's like, that's Boulder, who cares? If I talk to Lyons, if I talk to Louisville, if I talk to Superior, if I talk to Erie, they say, what is Longmont doing? What is Longmont doing? Longmont's the biggest city, the most influential city, like people care a lot about what you're doing. So I just, I don't wanna, make you feel bad, but I want you to know that there's a lot of people watching because they're interested and impressed and inspired by Longmont. So in my, my invitation that I'll end with is we structured our wage increase such that we could all get on the same page. So instead of having a philosophically, uh, what? there could have been a philosophical way of calculating our number to meet some obligation or goal. It was calculated in such a way so that in 2025, if we wanted to, we could all get on the same number. So if, if you wanted to join us, we could all be at 1657 in January, and we would have the same number. And if Boulder wanted to join us, they could be there. And if Lafayette wanted to join us, they could be there. So that we would have the same regional market wage in 2025. And so if you look at the chart, it looks less scary with the numbers, with the dollar amounts, in my opinion. And so it's really just saying, in 2025, do you want the single mother to make 1657 instead of 1481? Like that's, so that's really the only question you can answer at a time. We can't go higher than that. Like there are state laws and rules, like there are boundaries. We can't address every issue that's brought up because of the way the legislation was written, but we can make programs to offset the negative effects. And like we, compression. Like compression. Yeah, we can come yeah. up with all kinds of programs to address what we know will happen that could be negative, but we have an opportunity, if people wanted to, to all get on the same number for January 1st, 2025. If you guys want to talk about this one year at a time, and you want to have this conversation every single year, <laughs> you can start the conversation. <laughs> I don't want to have the conversation every year. And if I was a business, I would not want the government to have a conversation every year. I would want certainty about what the plan and the program is. But if that makes you uncomfortable and you don't want to plan out for 10 or 15 or 30 years and you just want to say, what are we going to do this January? You could just do something this January. We could all be on the same page and continue the conversation next year. So that's my invitation. Wish you a week. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I will. I will bring this conversation to a close. Uh, and I, I just want to say how much I appreciate the thoughtfulness that, that each of you um, brought to the table on the issue. And it's it's not an easy one. Um, I was involved on the executive committee of the statewide ballot measure in 2016 when the state did increase the minimum wage. And, and because it previously was in the Constitution, we had to do it as a constitutional and um, and what we got um, was an, uh, was a target of twelve dollars an hour, and you know I, this was back in twenty sixteen, so that seemed like an aspirational goal. Um, however, at the same time, there was a, the that's when the fight for fifteen um, campaign was really going nationally, and um, and and labor was not happy with the decision of, of this executive to go only to $12 an hour. And we, because this is what happens when you, know, you have to go to the voters, mm -hmm. is that we, polling told us we could not pass this as a statewide measure if we were going up to 12. 
um, because it was too quiet. And we said, okay, we can't do that. But after we do this, we will work on this electrical legislature passed in 2019 to say that, that areas with higher cost of living um, it could go higher because we do have such a divergence in Colorado. I, you know, when I think about, so what's the function of a minimum wage? Um, and I, I, I've, heard, I've read some comments that I think are very well founded that if it's too, if the cost of housing is too high, the cost of childcare is too high, the cost of healthcare is too high, it really is not the job of business to address these market failures in other areas. The purpose of a minimum wage is to say, just as a matter of, of commerce and basic human decency and social welfare, an hour of labor, a fair amount of pay, what is a fair amount of pay for an hour of labor? Um, you're putting in an hour of work. And you know, we talk you talk about you know, different quality of employees. Of course, that, that has always existed, it's existed at every level of minimum wage, and you reward and compensate people better. But you know, it goes to what what Mr. Solzman was saying about, you know, what is, what is it fair to pay in exchange for an hour of somebody's time? And if they're not working hard enough, you have to have tools to deal with it. And you know, and that's what the, the role of it is. So we, we we need to address affordability in housing, we need to address affordability in child care. But I think we I think we came to a very good place in Boulder County. I just I want to just address a couple of other issues that came up. Um, there's a lot of data, a lot of research, because minimum wages have been going different ways all over the country. And um, businesses do not pick up and move. Um, now, new businesses may make decisions about how to, where to locate based on the cost of doing business, and there's so many things that go into that. The cost of labor is just one of them, the cost of utilities, plant equipment, access to skilled labor markets. But there's, there is no research to show that a business will shut down here and move over here when they've got their, you know, they've invested in their, in their building, they've invested in building their clientele, their customer base, their, um, so they, they tend to stay and they find ways to deal with it. And what we were hearing in 2016 during the campaign was, oh, well, you know, they're just going to automate. Um, and so there go those entry-level, low-wage jobs. And our response was, good, because chances are those are pretty bad jobs. And if, so if you can automate, you know, I, my first job was, was at uh, McDonald's. And they, you know, I remember taking the, the french fry hopper out and putting it out there to let all the grease fly off it. And, you know, this hot grease is splattering all over everything. Well, they made a machine that could do that. Wow, that was great. So now people can do higher level, more higher value things. So it does lead to innovation. Um, $25 an hour, like that's a scary, it, you know, it, it is a triggering number. Like, wow, that's a lot. But, you know, think about what that would look like in 2030, which is where our target is. Is, you know, 2030 is six, six years from now. So, you know, it, in 2030, I, I doubt that it will be scary. But you know, we'll, I think Boulder is going to probably, City of Boulder is probably going to do three years of 80% and then go to CPI thereafter. There are all kinds of different ways to do it. Um, you know, the, the tip differential, I've, I've heard some conversations around going back to the legislature. And because this really addresses uh, the, the issues with restaurants and um, you know they're struggling to employ people and going back to the legislature and asking for a larger tip differential. It's they just set it at whatever the state differential is, which is three dollars and two cents an hour. But and that what's in the constitution says state minimum wage. Um, the tip differential is three dollars and two cents, but for a local minimum wage, um, I don't know that the Chinese have really looked at this, but you know, there that's an area where I think people, you know, there's a reasonable discussion to be had about whether whether that should be a higher, you know, a larger increment so that um, so that restaurants you don't get that big disparity in front of the house and back of the house. And then lastly, as you know, you know with, with unemancipated minors, the state law did allow um, a lot of different, you know, not I, I 
I don't know that you would set it different in any way, or whether you would just have them separate to the state. But yeah, this is, uh, I, I think I first met Scott Cook when um, I was going around debating various people <laughs> about this issue. And, you know, it, economics is one of these things that, you know, there's a study as the on the one hand and on the other hand, and a recent study says we're kind of just have a one-handed economist here because there are there are studies across the board. But I I think the bulk of the research um, you know, shows that it doesn't um, it doesn't kill jobs. Um, and, but that's where you know, I think doing something that's reasonable and incremental and really addresses um, you know, addresses local conditions is what. Thank you, everyone. That was really fantastic. And And I'm just wondering, um, you say, you know, everybody's looking at long run because of the long run. You say there's fear. And I'm just wondering what led you to believe that there's fear for this. Because I think we actually feel like our, we're on a positive track in terms of what people are doing. Uh, I heard. I don't understand what you just. I don't understand. So you, when you said you're on a positive track, do you mean you're going to pass an increased minimum wage this year? No. What well, that's that, that, that so I hear. Are above anything that's on I agree. Much closer to. I agree, and so the I have heard fear from elected officials in making. Did the, you hear that from us? I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. From your council, and I didn't. I. I would. I. I didn't read, take it that way. That took is, it as a practical point of view. Um, I heard, I didn't hear it from you, but from the from the body as a yes. whole, what I would say is like there's a lot of desire to do it and fear that it might have negative consequences. That's what I've heard from the body as a whole, like that there was a real desire to make a change and to address that the minimum wage doesn't reflect what the market minimum wage is and concern for the businesses and fear of what the negative consequences would be. I think the only fear yeah. I have is really uh, setting a minimum wage in long run and finding mm -hmm. uh, that uh, I'm actually setting a minimum wage for uh, well, the county to have all kinds of employees uh, from somewhere else that will not deal with this situation come in. And now I, I've, I've done this uh, with the best intentions and best thoughts and, uh, and, and, and attempts to make that happen, just to have folks come from somewhere else just to try to, uh, that would be a fear of mine. Question I, that for the group. Is a I just have a question for the group, because I think this is a really good discussion, and I think each of us would like to keep having it. Yeah. It's yeah. 7.15, we have yeah. other topics that are going to be really interesting. Would you rather hunt on the rest of the topics and keep talking about this, or move on? Like, I think we just should decide. On. On. Well, we have time at the end, we can circle back. No, well, we will not have time at the end. Hurry up. So I do encourage everybody to set up copies, copies with each other, because I think each of us has a, like, well, this is how we would do that, and this is what that is. So the next topic is affordable housing, and I'll turn it to Commissioner Lynch. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah, thanks. Um, as the housing lead for Boulder County, this is one of the pieces, um, so I'm just going to go right into the text, because I think that might be the most helpful from an update standpoint. Um, reminder that November 2023 is when Boulder County voters make that decision to create the first, truly the first um, ongoing financial commitment from a, a tax to affordable and attainable housing. And so that's what the AHT means. Um, and so what we have done, the great news about this particular tax that was passed in November 23 is that we have, we have had this whole year, or 24, to put together the process of um, distribution, criteria, um, and really look at the ballot language, which focuses on, as a reminder, and I know I was, I was if y'all were here at the council meeting, I was here presenting about it um, mm -hmm. probably in, I don't know, September of 23, um, the way I come and visit you on all the great topics. This one specifically has in the ballot language, and I would completely um, encourage folks to go back to that, especially if you have constituents with questions, and before you're caught with council, I would go take a look at the ballot language. But it talks about development, and it also talks about housing support services. And so we have had, um, as we had that housing summit in January, the kept hearing, like, what would it look like if regional housing partnership was the group? Um, and so we went to them, and when I say we, got a group of staff that's with Boulder County Housing Authority and also our housing, our new housing department staff, 
Um, and so we've been working together, um, brought that group in to hear from them. And as some, of, as some of you know, because some of you had some conversations with members of the Regional Housing Partnership, they put together a distribution model instead of focusing on the advisory group and how that particular could function. So between that um, and June 20th was our, one of our meetings, um, and then we just had another meeting two weeks ago, I believe. Um, and so because of the dis focus on the distribution, we had another five models that were created in different places. Everyone from the Family Resources Centers were involved, our city managers, um, our county manager and manager, and um, a couple of other groups, Boulder Housing Partner and Housing Authorities. So the great news is there's a lot of work. There's a ton of collaboration. Each of the different partners that brought models are talking to their constituents and talking to their neighbors and residents to try and get input, which is exactly what we want to do and work that I believe we're really modeling at Boulder County in regards to how do we engage um, in regards to this tax. So the update is we are now working together as internal staff group. We also, um, all of our meetings are public, and I think people don't understand that, but we have people come in and just sit in the room just, just like we have this meeting tonight. Um, and, and, and people otherwise just ask about them, but they're all public. Um, and we had folks asking, could you also put on a Zoom? And so we did that for those different public meetings. They work differently than the city council, but I just want to show that. Um, so we've had a lot of engagement. Um, and so now our work team is um, coming together. We are hoping um, that we might make this budget cycle. That's kind of the goal. But um, you can imagine we started budget presentations this week. So the timing's been, uh, um, we're, we're still going to be trying to meet our October 8th as a deadline. Um, the important piece there, and a question that I think city council folks have had, and also um, potentially partners you work with in the space of housing, is is this, whose decision is this? Like all of our working groups on our, all of our tax measures and other projects, you heard like the work that we each need on, or some of it, and so we will go back, that housing team I was just talking about, and we'll go back to the full board with a couple proposals and say, here's what we're thinking based on all of the work and all of the input. And, and then collectively, the board's going to make a decision. And our hope is that they're going to say, we love it, yes. Um, but we might go back to the drawing board. And so we are ready that if we can make it into this um, budget season, we will. And if not, we'll come with the budget amendment in 2025. So that's the quickest, just knowing the time without seeing it. Um, that's the quickest. Just update on what's the process and where are we with that affordable and attainable housing tax that you all participated in and supported, which we're very thankful, and we're thankful to voters for saying yes. So the process is basically how are you going to um, distribute the dollars? In, in what way? Is it going to be a grant? Is it going to be, is that what you're trying high level, to do? High level, yes. Okay. I'll be very impressed if everybody says, we love it. They won't love it because the problem is with affordable housing, there's just insufficient resources to go around with the magnitude of the problem. But we are going to fund some really great projects. We have really great units in Longmont now and wraparound services for residents. And like there are some, some of the best examples we have of successful affordable housing is in Longmont. And just really fantastic units where somebody can get their life on a different trajectory. So it is something we should all be proud of. I just mean we get different engagement. Right. So, <laughs> oh, I thought you. I thought you were referring to the will the board love the idea. Yeah, no, no, I'm not sure. And I was. I'm yeah, sure it'll be too. beautiful and mindful mm -hmm. and very well thought out. Well, Thank you. Our last I was the first the, uh, city's yeah. meeting, we had Molly O'Donnell here, and she seems to be. I mean, everybody comes to her. Molly can you tell us what we should be doing. I mean, so we are. We have just such an incredible team, but that's really what is is nice. And I think it's it's a team that is willing to extend their their services in helping the, uh, the other communities get on the same page and say, hey, you don't have to you don't have to make the same mistakes. You can learn from our mistakes or from what we have learned already without making a mistake. So I mean, uh, and that's part of just really great leadership out of our city manager and, and uh, having the right strategic people in the right specific spots. Well, it's, just, it's important to remember that Boulder County Housing Authority would still be the housing authority for the communities that don't have their own housing. So it, it wouldn't, I don't think, 
the, the goal would be to, to have each house, each municipality have its own housing authority because they would No, be no, I'm just saying that she was a great resource to help. Oh, yeah, folks. yeah, very, very much so. So I do have a suggestion, and I, I brought it up a little bit on the Dr. Clark meeting today, is that we, I think most of the municipalities have a problem with inclusionary zoning and, and their developments. And we end up with having what we are producing very well is lower income uh, residential areas, rather than having a development that has multiple uh, uh, effects. Yes. And that is the whole point of inclusionary zoning, and developers don't want to do it. Um, so in your conversations, it would be great if this could go somehow to an independent developer to help them include lower income uh, residents in their developments so that we don't end up with places that are just, oh, all these people over here are low income. And they're all living in this area, mm -hmm. to me, which is redlining. Yeah. And, um, I think that's one of our problems, is we cannot get independent developers to develop low inside in their developments. Just, thank you. So I just want to clarify, you're talking about private developers versus yes. development like BCHA. Okay, yes. Any housing authority, outside of a housing authority, independent developers. Okay, just want to clarify, and I know some of our boards had that conversation. Yeah. Since we have other topics, I have a lot of thoughts about that. <laughs> <laughs> we have other topics to get to. Okay. That was a great update. Thank you. There's a ton more that we could talk about in this, and so at our next meeting or maybe some focus meetings, we'll talk about um, affordable housing more. Um, I would love to combine sugar mill redevelopment and annexation into one topic because mm -hmm. they're related. Mm -hmm. And so um, this would be the time to have any conversation about uh, either of those topics that you know, would be resolved from us all sitting together. Mm -hmm. I know, um, I'll just speak for myself, but I bet that the board thinks the same thing. We haven't had a chance to check in with each other on this, but it's the opportunity of the Sugar Mill's really exciting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, we, well, I was gonna say we, I think we, <laughs> um, I think I can safely say we want to be good partners mm -hmm. in facilitating what needs Longmont has in that redevelopment. And so if there's anything you want to discuss on that, please let us know. I'll get rid of the homeless there. Yeah, so um, the sugar mill's been on and off yeah. as we continue moving through this. Obviously, we know that um, it's not in the long lot, so the strain of the sugar mill is really um, primarily being borne by Boulder County Sheriff's Department and down to the fire department. We have um, IGA you know, to support if there's an issue. And, and you know, we clearly know that some of our biggest challenges there are really related to um, the types of activities that are occurring on the property. Um, I've said it publicly, we um, had significant busts with hundreds of top thousands of mm -hmm. pills there. Um, we know that it's also an anchor to many of the crimes that occur in, in that area of our community, but much more hard to that. The challenge with the sugar mill is a um, working, so the city's been working on this longer than I've been here, and I've been here 12 years. And so, and we've been working on it since we've been here. I think we're at the precipice of being able to do something. Obviously, you have the land over there. The biggest challenge with the sugar mill is really when you look at the environmental contamination that occurs at that location. And so, when you look at the work that has to be done, uh, because you want to preserve the historic asset. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's interesting is structure that it's solid, the brick is not structural. Mm -hmm. The brick is actually decorated. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the steel structure, and it's, it's in decent shape. So you want to preserve the history of the community, but in order to remediate the environmental issues and make it structurally sound, that's like 65 to 70 million dollars. And so, today. Mm -hmm. So obviously the other thing that you're chasing is time. Um, because the more time the more expensive it gets, the more time, the less likely you are to do that. And and so we run models in terms of looking at urban renewal, looking at um, general improvement districts in order to really inject that. And the big issue is I think for anyone to do anything on that, it's gonna take all the governmental entities 
um, and the capacity they have within the urban world to, to give that increment in order to deal with that issue. Because, you know, this is a tradition, this is what I think urban renewal is designed for, is to take these wide areas and deal with it. And it's going to take that and some type of district component in order to just carve through it. And as we've talked about it, when we think about affordable housing and all of that, inclusionary housing, those are all things that we've talked about in terms of looking at a much broader structure, in terms of it just being a market rate development, looking at how you can bring workforce housing in, look how you can bring affordable housing into this. We're actually testing our house pad project um, that's going to go under construction in September, which is for sale affordable and for sale attainable is really a model that we can utilize as we're looking at this development so it truly is an inclusionary project. Mm -hmm. and, and there's like the stiff headwinds as I've ever seen on any project related to those environmental conditions. I do want to thank Janet and the staff. We've all gotten together and started working at what can we do to deal with the issues in front of us and I think we're all moving. Uh, but the next conversation really is, you know, it's going to take all of the jurisdictions that can step in on from an increment standpoint and be able to, to kick this along. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I don't think it's going to happen, to be frank. Not seeing anyone else jumping on it. I think everyone's going to just about time. Um, yeah. Well, I just. I was going to ask, and it sounds like, uh, have you done some, some concept planning for that site? It sounds like you have some. Yeah. 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 So we've done an area plan, the uh, potential developer has done some design work, okay. we've done okay. environmental planning. Third, yeah. third graders, third graders. Our third graders do oh, this design. Okay. So yeah, yeah, we've got it all. all. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'd love so, to so, 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 so think of uh, the mindset there's a lot of division like that. Yeah. But that's great to, to oh, yeah. to see just give me a call. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, yeah. And then just ch checking in, are there any other annexation topics that folks want to discuss? Anything pending? I know there's been a couple. So I think I put, I asked the time this on the agenda because I was wondering about the status yes. of the Commonwealth States um, annexation and whether that's in progress. So everything is on hold because of litigation. And so, once the litigation is resolved, then I think that will then come into our system for right now. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Uh, we're going to take public comment now. Um, and it was posted on the long run agenda. So, if any members of the public would care to comment, you each have three minutes. Please stand up and let us know your name and then tell us what you'd like to tell us. You're at the mic, so I'll, I'll, I'll be gracious. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Sorry, we messed You're up. not going to keep us here until 2.15. Um, this, <laughs> this was really awesome, and what it told me was that yeah. just the, the more we can get together and connect and talk, so the better. Well. Like, this was really wonderful. And um, It looks like Barb is trying to wrangle some way that people can take food home, maybe. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we did not eat all of that. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you all. Thank you.